Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is the Other People Podcast. I'm Brad Listy, and I'm in Los Angeles. It's nice to be with you. It is Friday, and it is time for another flashback episode where I dig into the Other People archives and share an outtake from an episode out of the past. Today, I'm going to be sharing an outtake from episode 29, my conversation with author Ben Lurie. It first aired on December 25th, 2011. Ben Lurie is the author of two story collections. One is called Stories for Nighttime and Some for the Day, and the second one is called Tales of Falling and Flying. Ben is also the author of a picture book for children called The Baseball Player and the Walrus. Over the years, his stories have appeared in a variety of publications, including The New Yorker Magazine, Tin House, Reed Magazine, and Fairy Tale Review. His stories have been heard on This American Life and selected shorts, performed live at Word Theater in Los Angeles and London, and translated into many languages. Ben Laurie lives here in Los Angeles, and he is an instructor for the UCLA Extension Writers Program. Don't forget to subscribe to the Other People Podcast wherever you listen to shows. You can also subscribe on YouTube. I would love it if you signed up for my newsletter. It is free. You can do that at bradlisty.substack.com. And if you want to support this show, you can do that at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. Today's episode is brought to you by Mary Sue Rucci Books, publisher of the novel The Storm We Made by Vanessa Chan. It is a national bestseller, a sweeping epic about an unlikely spy and a secret love affair. I just spoke with Vanessa Chan on this program in episode 901. You can listen to that if you would like. The Storm We Made is a dazzling saga about the horrors of war, the fraught relationships between the colonized and their oppressors, and the ambiguity of right and wrong when survival is at stake. That's The Storm We Made, the best-selling debut novel by Vanessa Chan, available from Mary Sue Rucci Books. I should add that The Storm We Made is the official February pick of the Other People Book Club. If you want to sign up for that, you can do so at otherppl.com. Okay, so here we go with today's flashback episode, an outtake from episode 29, which first aired on Christmas Day 2011. It's hard to believe. What was that, 13 years ago? Almost? Something like that. Me and Ben Laurie talking to one another on Christmas Day 2011. Or not, I guess he wasn't at my house on Christmas Day, but it aired on Christmas Day. You know what I mean. I should mention that the full episode is available in the feed. So if you like this flashback and you want to go in for the full hour with me and Ben Laurie, you can do that. Just look for episode 29 wherever you get your podcasts. All right? All right. Let's do it. Here I am talking with Ben Laurie a long time ago. You, you can do that. Well, apparently, yeah. But I mean, like when you get like an injection, you're not a, you're not scared of needles or anything like that. No, I'm not scared of needles. No, I, I got over my fear of needles a long time ago. You did, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then after they scrape it off with a knife and and mop up the blood, then they take this little instrument and burn it about a million times, and you smell your skin burning. Wow. So wait, when you said you got over your fear of needles, you 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 never, were never an intravenous drug user, were you? No. Oh, okay, no. okay. Um. So yeah, so they, you just had a wart, you went in and got it burned off, and a wart is skin cancer related? No, I, I went in because I was worried that I had skin cancer for other reasons, but then it turned out that I just had a, a wart. But wait, what, what other reasons? You just thought you had like a mole or something? Yeah, there's a mole on my back, which they've been telling me I need to keep my eyes on for 35 years now. It sucks with your... No, I had the same thing. And like, I've had like lots of them removed, you know, not like, I'd say five or six of them removed, and... It's precautionary, but then I'm wondering if, like, my dermatologist is just sort of, like, banking. She's just, like, cashing checks. Like, yeah, I got to remove that mole. 
It's like yeah. 300 bucks, you know, whatever it is. But it's a simple procedure. I don't feel a thing. They go and do lab tests. The lab technician gets their check. It's all a scam. I mean, I get it. You want to be precautionary. But I just, I have such an inherent mistrust of, of doctors. Why is that? I mean, I think it, I guess I actually, I do have an answer. It's that I have a bad low back or I did for a lot of years and I went to every kind of doctor and every single one of them told me that they knew what was going on and none of them did. Yeah. You know, I feel like, and they get paid by the procedure, not by whether or not you get well. That bothers me. I'm sorry, Brad. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I'm glad you don't have skin cancer. Yeah, me too. The mole is looking okay? Well, what happened is they they took the mole off about maybe four months ago, five months ago, and um, it grew back. And when it grew back, it looked really scary. It was like black the way when you go on the internet and then look about skin cancer. Don't ever go on the internet and look at it. Because as soon as I, it's like a wormhole, you just get sucked in and Mm -hmm. it's bad. So then I went back expecting the guy to say, hey, no, nah, there's no, no worries, man. Instead, he looked at it and he said, and these are his words, he said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. He said it twice. And I said, did you just say, oh, my God? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what you want to hear. No. And he said, yeah. I said, oh, my God. Oh, but it's nothing to worry about. I was just surprised it grew back so fast. But we have to take this off immediately. So then they, they, they cut it out um, a lot deeper than they had the first time and got, like, stitches and stuff. Ugh. And then they would, they took it off to the lab, and then, um, like, two weeks went by, and I was supposed to get the results, and I went in, and they were like, oh, yeah, we're still, we have to do some more tests. So then I went in today, and, and the guy, he was just talking to me about other things for a while. I'm like, hey, did you happen to get the results? <laughs> yeah. He's, like, talking about his weekend and yeah. how the fourth was. Yeah. And he's like, no, everything's fine. Turns out he was, uh, it was just plastic. I don't know what that means. But he says it's just plastic, not cancer. So apparently I'm plastic, and that's good. Well, I mean, and yeah, you, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but you don't strike me as somebody who spent, like, excessive amounts of time in the sun. I've never left my house. Yeah, I was going to say, you're a shut-in. What are you worried about? <laughs> no, but I mean, I did. I lived in Colorado. I was always out hiking. And, like, look at my arms. Like, I, this is all pre-skin cancer, these uh, red... You need to get those arms removed. I have to have my... <laughs> to have my arms removed physically removed uh but no it's just like this big thing and i'm very conscious of the sun in ways and it's the worst thing in the world like the freaking sun it, the giver of life and it kills you yeah. it's like an irony i never really looked at it as the giver of life <laughs> yeah, i guess it's a big flaming ball, ball in the sky but i mean you know i just i had like i think because i grew up without sun as a child and the weather and in like the midwest and the brutal winters and they the, don't have sun in the summer they do, they do. You do, and 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 when you when when it comes out, you're so overjoyed. Like I remember spring break, like just getting to go to Florida, which now that I look back on, it, like Florida to me was like heaven, and like everyone in Indiana like wanted to get to Florida, and like now like you basically couldn't pay me to go to Florida, <laughs> like it's lost all of its allure to me, all of its allure. Like I just I don't like it, and I've been back once since, and I'm just like ugh. But, uh, there's alligators though. That's cool. That's cool. I mean, you know, and it's, uh, it's got its redeeming qualities. I don't mean to sound too judgmental, but it's just like, I think that the appreciation that I had for the sun then manifested itself in, uh, you know, living in a sunny climate and going outside and just being like so happy, but like being a little bit reckless with sunscreen and stuff like that. And now I'm, I'm pretty, pretty, uh, cautious, extra cautious. Oh, good. Do you wear sunscreen? I don't go outside. You don't go outside. You're not, but you're nocturnal too. You yeah. you roam the streets at night. Yeah. Sometimes I go for walks during the day, and I do wear sunscreen when I do that. You do. What's but your I, What's your SPF? Are you like forty five? As, as high as I can get. Yeah. 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 Like the old joke is that like how high? I mean, how high can it? How high does it get? Does it get into the th- three digits? Yeah, I've seen one hundred and twenty, but I've heard that over thirty is not really. Like at some point you just like squeeze out a long sleeve shirt, yeah. you know? <laughs> like, like, do you know what I'm saying? It's like paste. It's like, you're just like spackling yourself, but yeah. I'd like to get a parasol. I'm always envious of the ladies with parasols. I, yeah, I've thought of that too. Mm-hmm. Or just like having an umbrella. Yeah. Maybe just as like an affectation. Mm-hmm. I don't have it like, as a writerly affectation, especially now that, uh, you're getting ready to publish your book. And, uh, I guess I, I'm overdue in saying I'm talking to Ben Lori, author of stories for nighttime. And some for the day. Right. And I've been uh, plugging it because it's a TMB book club book. And one of the things that continues to, like, you know, uh, echo in my mind is making sure that I get the definite article 
placed properly in the title of your book. Yeah, it's tricky. It's not stories for the nighttime and some for the day. It's stories for nighttime. Yes. That was conscious. Okay, are you supposed to say the nighttime or is nighttime just kind of its own entity? You can say the nighttime, right? You mean in general? Yeah. You can say whatever you want. I know, but, <laughs> but is it proper English, Ben? These things concern me. Well, I was going for more of like a a general nighttime as opposed to an actual like not like one specific nighttime or right yeah uh, the day is, wasn't ex exactly the opposite of nighttime in the title it's sort of a little bit of a different and and because you feel like a lot of the I mean uh, I guess I should ask you first is this like literal you really do believe that some most of the stories in the book are best read at night after sundown well, I think everything's better at night after sundown. You do? Okay. Okay. So, like, taking that into account, uh, most of the stories were written after sundown, or all of them? You wrote, I mean, you work at night, correct? Yeah. I think, you know, my memory is not so good anymore, Brian. Well, neither is mine. <laughs> but I would say, yeah, probably pretty much all of them were written at night. Yeah. Sometimes in the, near the end of the book, I was probably working during the day, too, sometimes. Some for the day. Yeah. So, now, we're, uh... Like uh, as far as work schedule goes, like what what are your hour, working hours? Typically, does it vary? I mean, it varies. I don't even really have a set schedule of any kind. I don't know when I'm going to be waking up or going to sleep from one day to the next. But generally, yeah, I'm working at like three in the morning until eight. Wow, and it's evenings. quiet, and nobody's the phone isn't ringing. Yeah, must you have like night night friends? <laughs> I do. Duke, Duke is my night friend. So he's up too. Yeah, he's up too. So he'll just call you. Yeah, and we're speaking of of Duke Haney or Dr. Haney, the author Dr. Haney. Yes, uh, who's got a book out on the TMB Books imprint called Subversia. He does, which I highly recommend. Which you blurbed, I believe. I did. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you're working from three to five, uh, or from three a.m. to like eight a.m. or something like that. And I've talked to you about this before, and it's a great fascination to me because I really do think it's truly unique in that uh, you'll sit down and write in one shot. And this is how you typically work. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you will sit down and in one shot write an entire short story start to finish. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're very short. You know, they're probably around 700, 800 words usually. And, um, and that's the first draft. I mean, then I edit them for, you know, years and years. <laughs> So, you, okay, so you really pour over it. Yeah, usually the hardest part is getting the end. Usually the first shot around it, it gets you the first act and most of the second act, and then usually there's like a an ending which is wrong usually the first time around, and then you sort that out afterward. And then who was the short story writer? Wasn't there like a fantasy writer or somebody that you went to see read at the uh, mystery... Oh, and Mystery and Imagination? Yeah, um, that's well, a bookshop in Glendale, right? Mm -hmm. in yeah, Dennis Hutchison, he was a short story. He is a short story writer. Um, and he taught a class there on writing horror fiction. So I took that class and started writing. And what was it? I mean, didn't didn't he like deliver you some sort of key insight? Or it wasn't like you know, I don't want to overstate it or anything, but like it was one of those things where you were sort of like thinking about fiction and trying to figure out how to approach it, and he kind of gave you an insight that really sort of opened you up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, before that class, I was a screenwriter, and I was used to sort of working out story ideas, um, sort of as like building blocks, kind of arranging ideas for scenes and moments on a page and trying to figure out a story based around ideas that came out of the blue. And it's, it's, it seems totally ass backwards now that I'm trying to think about it. But um, And what Dennis taught me was to just sit down and start writing at the beginning and write through until it was done and just follow the story and never to have any ideas about what you were going to write or what you wanted to include in it or really look ahead at all and just sort of live the story through as it happened. Stay to I mean, not to sound too touchy-feely, but just stay totally present, watch the character, follow the character or characters. Yep. Let your imagination do its work. Yep. And so you'll sit down and you will have what an image in your head well usually when i sit down i don't have anything at all and then i just sit there and wait for the first idea or image or sentence and then go from there and then it just takes off mm -hmm. i mean usually sometimes if you're lucky yeah do you ever get uh dry spells like where it's like a week goes by and you can't write anything or are you typically pretty i have dry spells where i can't actually sit down 
you know, where I get too busy or I just don't feel like it. But as soon as I actually sit down, I don't usually have a problem. It comes to you. And then like, you work in this short form. I mean, it's, th this is also unusual. Like these stories are like, like you said, 700 words long, 1500 words long. Uh, there's a fantastical element to them. They work on, I, I call them like fables for adults. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? I mean, sure. you know, there's something about them that's very unique and they're, it seems like a unique hybrid, frankly. Uh, do you have a sense of like the component parts of it? Like you're based on your own like tastes. I mean, uh, you, you read so widely, uh, you know, for, I know, you know, Ben and I are, are, are buddies. So for listeners out there, it's like, you know, uh, I'm your Goodreads friend mm -hmm. and it makes me panicked because literally every day it's like, Ben just read, <laughs> you read like three books a day. It's, yeah, it's I just, shocking. I put them up in, in groups. You do? Okay. Yeah. So some of these books are books that you've read in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, in the last couple of weeks. couple sure. days. Yeah. <laughs> last couple of days. Yeah. But yeah, well, you know. Yeah. So, uh... No, I tend to think of it as, as just a Twilight Zone, really. I think of myself as writing for the Twilight Zone, even though it doesn't exist and they don't know who I am. You grew up watching it? Well, I grew up without a TV, and then when we got a TV, I discovered the Twilight Zone. Why was it one of the conscious decision by your parents to make a reader out of you? My parents, we actually had a TV when I was very little, and then supposedly it was stolen mm. when I was about three. I remember watching Sesame Street one time when I was really little. I, yeah, they were not big fans of television. And the only reason we finally got a TV when we did was because we got a computer and we got the TV as a monitor. Uh, well, that's, I mean, do you feel like you missed out on anything? Sure. And when we got a TV, I spent six years just watching everything that people had been talking about in school when I was growing up. In high school, I was watching like three, four episodes of Brady Bunch every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, because it's so pervasive, it was like socially isolating to an extent. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but I mean, then you just start binging on it, and then you wind up going off to where? You went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And so you were a great student in, in uh, high school. Were you, like, really driven? I wouldn't say I was driven. I would say it was um, not very challenging. Yeah. It was easy for you. Yeah. You're a bright guy. Okay. What are you good at? Like, what was there? Is there an area, like a, English, obviously? Were you a science guy? I mean, do you have that part of your brain working, too? I was a math guy. Okay, so yeah. math makes sense to you. Do you think that there's a mathematic... I mean, do you approach the writing of fiction mathematically? Do you deconstruct books in a way that, like, somebody like me who, you know, is very average at math might not? I don't really deconstruct books that I read at all. But when I write, I definitely write mathematically. I mean, I, I, write, I draw diagrams for the stories, not while I'm writing them, but afterwards, when I'm trying to figure out endings and see why things are working and why they're not, I, I draw diagrams. And I mean, there's sort of an equation that I work with um, that helps me sort of figure out where things have gone wrong or other avenues to explore. Actually, I just got a review of my book today. Someone published on a blog somewhere, which called the stories mathematically inevitable, which made me really happy because I was like, yes, that's what I've been trying to explain to people. That you've been trying to explain what? That the... That stories have a like inherent structure, which is sort of implicit in the premise, almost. Like once you write the, I mean, for me, once I write the first sentence, it's like everything is already there. It's just a matter of sort of unpacking it. But I feel like it's already out of my hands once the first sentence has been written. And then it's just like, it's like you have to like decode it almost, or yeah, it's like all I can do from that point on is mess it up. Hey. <laughs> I'm great at that. <laughs> what uh, what did these diagrams look like? I mean, does it look like the the, the scribblings of a madman, or are they really like beautifully done? Are you using a ruler? Like, what what is it? Well, I'm not drawing them, you know, to show people. But I mean, they all look the same. They uh, it's a it's just a three act diagram. They look it looks a little bit like an eyeball kind of. Second act sort of gets wider, and the and the very center of the story where the the middle of the eyeball is the midpoint of the story. And I don't, it sounds insane, I know. No, but it doesn't. Yeah. This, this is the thing, is that it actually sounds sane. <laughs> well, because like most writers, I think they work intuitively, or they're, you know, they're making them up as they go along, or they're struggling with an outline. I guess authors who really do sit there and do the, the gritty work of a detailed outline prior to composition, mm -hmm. those kinds of people might be able to uh, 
feel similarly or, mm-hmm. you know, I think they're similar to what you do. But for me or for most uh, writers who work kind of like day by day, making it up as they go, um, you know, you're kind of, I guess you're kind of a happy median. You're right in between because you do the make it up as you go. And then afterwards you sort of outline it, <laughs> right? Yeah. you know, and that's unusual, but it's like, I, you know, I, I feel sort of, uh, envious of that mathematical brain and the ability to sort of unpack. Well, I could, I could teach it to you in about 15 minutes. Well, you should, you know, maybe, maybe after this is over with, you can teach me how to do that. All right, everybody. There we have it. Today's flashback, an outtake from episode 29, my conversation with Ben Laurie. It first aired on December 25th, 2011, a reminder that the full episode is available in the feed. So if you like what you just heard and you want to listen to the full talk, you can do that. All episodes of this show are available to listeners wherever you get podcasts. If you would like to find out more about Ben Laurie and his work, you can do that at benlaurie.com. Follow him on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky. Don't forget to subscribe to the Other People Podcast wherever you listen to shows. You can also subscribe on YouTube, follow the program on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. Sign up for my weekly email newsletter at bradlisty.substack.com. Join the Other People Patreon community at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. You can join the Other People Book Club at otherppl.com. If you have a couple of minutes and you want to help me out, please give this show a rating and write a little review wherever you listen. It helps the show find new listeners. If you would like to get another People t-shirt or a sweatshirt, you can do that at the show's official website, otherppl.com. Last but not least, I have a book out. I have many books out. Not many, but a few. And the latest is a novel called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything, available now in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook so you can listen to me read my book aloud, if that sounds good. Or you can read it yourself, quietly. It's up to you. Again, it is a novel. It's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. All right, so coming up on Sunday, I will be in conversation with Lauren Markham. She has a new book out called A Map of Future Ruins. It is available from Riverhead. I had a great talk with Lauren Markham, a very fascinating conversation about human migration and the immigration crises that are unfolding all over the planet as we speak. So stay tuned.